welcome to the show. We have another great guest today, a legend, in fact. I don't say that often, uh, but J.J. French. He is one of the guitarists from Twisted Sister, and a lot of people don't know this, but he's actually, uh, he founded the band back in 1972, and it was originally called Silver Star, and he even sang in the band for a little bit. Uh, eventually, Dee Snyder joined few, about four years later, and it took the band 12 years from when they started to really when they had their big break with Stay Hungry, and obviously everyone knows the big hits from that record, We're Not Gonna Take It, I Want to Rock. Uh, but then, you know, the band fell apart and then uh, JJ reinvented himself by managing the band Seven Dust and, and then Twisted Sister became popular again. And so we'll talk all about this in the interview. And I assume more will be told in his book, which will be out in September 2021. So depending on when you're listening to this episode, it's either going to be out soon or it's already out. Um, but for now, just enjoy JJ's stories. We start off on a little bit of a tangent with some conspiracy theories and religion and some, some interesting stuff, which I found fascinating. Uh, but if there's ever a topic or subject you want to just skip, uh, just look at the show notes and you can see everything that we talk about and you can go right to the parts that you want to hear about. You might only be here to hear about the uh, Seven Dust Managing story, which is also fascinating, but I enjoyed all of it. I think the whole interview is, is solid. So here it is. Check it out. Welcome the legendary JJ French to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. Where are you located? I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona right now. Okay. I've lived here about for uh, 10 years. Podcast? What's that? How long have you been doing the podcast? Uh, I just uh, hit the two year mark. How are you doing? Good. I love it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a crazy world, isn't it? Yeah, because you do one too. The French Connect, the J, is it the JJ French Connection? Is that what it's called? JJ French Connection. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, that's and great. I just listened to a little bit of one today with a conspiracy theory guy. That, uh, <sighs> I got to finish that one. That sounded interesting. I've had that a conspiracy a theory fun. people too, so it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I listened to conspiracy radio at night to go to sleep because mm -hmm. it's crazy, crazy stuff. It sure is. And, uh, Richard is the host. Do you know about that? Do you know about Coast to Coast? Do you know about the show Coast to Coast? Do you know about this? No, I don't, I don't know about that. Just radio show in the world. Oh, it's the largest terrestrial radio show in the world. It's got 600 stations. Wow. And it's, uh, um, this guy, uh, George Norrie is the host. He took over for Art Bell. You don't know who Art Bell is. That you know? name and sounds familiar, but it's like, yeah. It's legendary in the radio world. Right. He had a conspiracy, you know, his shows were all about UFOs and crazy stuff. And, and Art Bell retired. George Norrie took over. And it's the biggest radio show. It's bigger than Rush Limbaugh's show. It's it's gigantic. It's overnight. It's five hours. Anyway, Richard Serrett, who I had on my show, is yeah. a fill-in. And he has his own conspiracy radio show, which I get through Tune In Radio. And he just gets a lot of crazy people. And I love listening to it because it's so out there. Uh, it's entertaining. What is your favorite conspiracy theory? What is the one where, or is there any that you think that are legit? Yeah. Well, I used to not believe in UFOs at all. I used to think it was just total nonsense. I didn't, I didn't understand why you would travel 8 billion miles to then look at the testicles of some farmer in Kansas. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just didn't know if that, yeah, if that's the best use of technology. You know, cause you, well, they, they took me in a spaceship and they, and they checked my testicles out. I'm thinking that's why they came here. You know? Right. I also wondered why all UFOs tended to look the same in a particular era. So in other words, in the 50s, they all look like inverted pie plates. And in the 60s, they all look like something else. And then in the 70s, when Close Encounters came out, they all look like Close Encounters. And I started thinking, do they have like a General Motors somewhere in Zycon? <laughs> and they go, you know, we have like the new, the new model. Yeah. Let's send the pie plate model out. Well, let's let's send the inverted uh, saucer out. So I, I, these were all just funny observations. Like, like, why do you go to the expense to get here, uh, traveling billions and billions of miles using technology that is so far beyond anything that we can even conceive of, if all you're doing is screwing around with our Air Force every once in a while? Well, yeah, that's what it, I mean, but you've seen those videos of the military released, right? So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're aliens from outer space. It just means no. literally UFOs, unidentified flying objects. Flying it's, object, it's, yeah. We don't know what it is, but that's what makes it so fascinating. There's all these theories, of course. Yeah, there's all these theories. I don't know. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a, I guess it's, it's fun. 
Anyway, I used to not believe in them. I kind mm-hmm. of believe in them. conspiracy theories. I mean, I don't know. My Here's my question. I ask people, if you could go back in time to any time in the history of the world to somehow verify something you've heard or read about, where would you go? So let me throw that at you. If you could go back, where would you go? Oh, I would go see the dinosaurs for sure. I'd want to see. I've never seen a dinosaur. That'd be amazing. Okay. So I would go back to the crucifixion to see if it really happened. Because, you know, there's really no proof that Jesus ever lived. That's a conspiracy. That's a conspiratorial concept. The fact that it's a virgin birth. If it wasn't a virgin birth, that would kind of blow the whole Catholicism thing right out the window. I mean, right. The Christianity thing would would crumble if it wasn't, if there was no virgin birth, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to know when these religions were all conceived, Judaism, Christianity, um, Islam, did they sit around and think how they were going to do this? I mean, if you think about the Bible, the Bible is written over a 124 year period of time over an expanse of 5,000 miles. And supposedly it's to tell the truth of our origin, but you can't get 10 people to agree on a car accident. You can't get 10 people to agree that what they saw, they saw. So how do you trust 125 years over a distance of 5,000 miles? uh, Anything, you know, right. I mean, I don't mean to to say that religion doesn't exist. I just mean I, I, knowing mankind the way I the way I believe it is. I it's almost it's illogical to me. The whole thing's illogical. So I mean, that's just my yeah. No, it's an interesting. I mean, I like hearing people's different uh, opinions on that because I, I have friends that are Christian that. They're one. They will not open their mind even to UFOs. They think that uh, my friend, who's a diehard Christian, he's a preacher. He he thinks UFOs are are fallen angels. So that's another like. So that's his theory. Then other people think UFOs are aliens. And so I mean, all this stuff is like everyone has their own theory. Nobody knows for sure any of this stuff. I mean, so yeah, you're right. If you had a time machine, you'd go back and see and verify. That'd be really interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, did it or didn't it happen? Was the if there was no virgin birth, that then that shoots down, that pretty much takes out a whole religion. And I'm, you know, my parents were Jewish, but I was not raised in a religious household, a secular household. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, my parents' attitude was, you know, follow your own path and figure it out. What I would like to know, actually, is what percentage of people change their religions in their lifetime because if every religion tells you there's one pathway and they're the golden pathway then why is it that 10 percent or 20 percent or 30 percent i don't know what the percentage is but a certain percentage of the human race changes religions i mean i always thought that um when you're born up until you're about 14 or 15 you are the religion that your parents tell you you are it's as simple as that in fact your parents are your God because they created you. <laughs> yeah. There's you know, definitely so some truth to that. Gave you life. Your parents created you. And mm-hmm. then your parents have taught you things. And so up until probably around 15, when you become a rebellious punk, you buy into just about everything they say. And then one day they go, screw you. I don't believe anything you tell me. So what percentage of the human race has changed religions? That's I've always thought of, thought about. Well, that. yeah, and I always think that um, you know that's one argument I have with my Christian friend is like, well, what if you were born in a different part of the country? Because then that religion is dominant religion, and and everyone thinks that that's the god. So how do you know which one's right? It's it's confusing to me. I, I don't know. And I've gone to like different kinds of churches just to see what they're like, and uh, I, I don't know. It's an, it's an interesting topic and discuss. I always try to keep an open mind with all of it. I, I don't know. I don't ever. That's why it's interesting when people say, I know 100% there is a God, there isn't a God. This is the God. This, I mean, who knows? I don't know how people know that stuff. Yeah. Well, I don't know, but it doesn't seem logical to me that 1.8 billion people think this is the way 2.3 billion people think that's the way mm-hmm. 3.2 billion people think that's the way. Then you have China and they're atheists. And so, uh, you know, it's either everybody's right or everybody's wrong. 
but no, there's no one pathway. So I don't like uh, dogmatic people drive me crazy. Open-minded people I have fun with, but dog, you know, <laughs> the only yeah. way, uh, then there's no conversation left. Right. You know? Well, don't you think too, though, a lot of like, I, I mean, I don't know. So with some of the, um, you know, the more, uh, I don't know, pardon the term, like hocus pocus parts of some of the religions, you know, that this, you know, this happened or that event or whatever, but a lot of the uh, beliefs in terms of the morals and stuff, you know, hopefully they're, you know, training people to be good people. I know there's some, obviously some things that Christians have done, especially in other religions that have, you know, holy wars and things like that, that are bad. But I mean, don't you think that, you know, deep down all, all people are good. And that's one thing we all, all have in common, whether we believe this religion or that religion. Well, there's probably some sort of um, basis of 10 commandments, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. basically say thou shalt not kill, you know, yeah, that's a good rule. Some basic stuff like that, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, uh, that probably are universal. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you brought up, you know, but the other thing too is that do you believe in the do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in hell? Do you believe in the devil? Do you believe you can be possessed by the devil? I don't believe there's such a thing as a devil. I believe there's such a thing as mental illness. If you're a mentally ill person, you do some pretty bad shit. Okay, mm -hmm. so I don't think that. You can tell somebody that the devil told you to do it, but the point is you're psychotic and you have mental illness. So the real bad people in the world are mentally ill human beings. Now, whether you want to ascribe that to some supernatural control force, that's another whole aspect of religion. I don't. I just think bad people are bad people because you take 10,000 people, you put them in a room and you look at their behavioral profile You'll probably see a pretty consistent uh, anywhere in the world. I'll bet you you see consistencies. Mm -hmm. I bet you you'll see X percent are gay. X percent are narcissistic. X percent are empathetic. Mm -hmm. And so on. And I don't really think sure. that it's cultural that much. I think it really is a broad-based analysis of the human behavioral cycle. And yes, you can be influenced by region for sure. But I think um, your deeply held views of what is right and what is wrong are probably imbued in you by your parents. And if you grossly veer from it, it's probably due to mental illness, having to do with mental illness, not because you're controlled or owned by the devil. Mm -hmm. you know, having yeah. said that, my favorite guitar player joke goes like this. A guitar player dies, wakes up, and um, strangely enough, he's in what looks like a concert hall, like Madison Square Garden. And uh, he opens his eyes and the devil's standing in front of him. And he says to the devil, where am I? And the devil goes, you're in hell. And the guy says, yeah, but it looks like Madison Square Garden. And the devil says, well, you know, hell is like a overhyped nonsense. You know, it's like not anything like you think it is. In fact... Uh, would you like to meet these musicians who are on the stage right now doing a sound check? And the guy, the guitar player gets up and walks down to the stage. And there is John Bonham on drums, Jimi Hendrix on guitar, John Lord on keyboards. You know, all these incredible musicians are standing there and he's looking at this thing. He says to the devil, are you sure I'm in hell? And the devil says, oh, yeah, yeah, you're in hell. And the guy goes, but... But this, the stage is amazing, and the light show is incredible, and the PA is incredible, and the music, he goes, yeah, yeah, but you're in hell. He says, um, okay, so the devil says, do you want to play along with the band? And the, and the guitar player goes, of course I want to play with the band. So the devil says, well, what kind of guitar do you want? And the guitar player goes, do you mean I can pick any guitar? And so anyone you want. So he says, uh, a 1959 Les Paul, because that's one of the most revered guitars in the history of mankind. And the devil gives him the 59 Les Paul and the guitar player says, are you sure I'm in hell? And the devil says, yeah, yeah, you are in hell. So the devil says, well, what kind of amplifier do you want? And he says, well, I'd like to have three Marshall Plexi 100 watt stacks. And the devil goes, bingo. And there's 300 watt, three 100 watt Marshalls. And the guitar player says, are you sure I'm in hell? And the devil says, yeah, 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 you're, you're in hell. So um, the devil says, now what? And he says, well, I'd like to plug in. Can I get a chord? And the devil gives him a chord. And the guitar player plugs in and he hits a, an E chord. And it's the most incredible tone he's ever heard in his life. And he says to the devil, are you sure I'm in hell? And the devil says, yeah, yeah, you're in hell. And the guitar player turns around to the devil and says, when can I play my solo? And the devil goes, never. <laughs>
<laughs> That's great. But you know, a lot of those '90s bands, they didn't, they wouldn't do solos. Like they got, they, yeah. that wasn't cool or whatever. Yeah, it was a rejection of Van Halen and the Shredder world. I love that stuff, though, and I love the screams and all that. I, I, I like, I like that kind of music. I think if you have that kind of talent, you got to use it. Yeah. Maybe not every is- song, but at least some, some of the times you got to show off a little, right? Uh, yeah, eras define taste, and you know. When I was growing up, we didn't have guitar heroes to watch on YouTube. Mm-hmm. You had to buy that, put it on, take the needle, put it on the record, play the song, and then you pick the needle up and you played it again. And you pick the needle up and you played it again. And you were wearing out the record and you were wearing out the, the phono stylus. And you put a quarter, you taped a quarter onto the top of it to make sure it wouldn't skip. And that's how you learn how to play. And now you got 8 billion shredders out there all on YouTube. And from a technique standpoint, there's a lot of really super players. Yeah, I know for sure. It's hard to keep up. I mean, I see kids on YouTube with millions of views and I'm like, I've never even heard of this kid, but he's amazing. Yeah, he's amazing. But you know, the other thing is they're amazing, but they have no soul to back it up with yet because you need years of experience to imbue the emotion of playing into which, your music, you know, yeah. and, and, which and of, so yeah. that's like, you know, I, that sounds like some old guy going <laughs> oh, man, back in my day, you know, we had to take a horse and buggy to a concert to see Led Zeppelin. We had no gasoline. And I don't want to sound like that, I, but I will say that most of the musicians that I like are older who have some sort of a, um, who, who, who wear their experiences on their sleeve and not just read it out of a book. No, for sure. And, uh, you know, your career is so amazing. I want to talk about that. But before really your music career started, I mean, I didn't know this portion of your story that there was a five year run or so where you were uh, you were doing drugs and dealing drugs. And you just and the most amazing part of this to me is that you just quit cold turkey. And it doesn't sound like from what I know that you ever had any slip ups after that or ever went back. How the no. hell did you do that? Because uh I have a, I have an incredible survival gene. And so, um, yeah, I can talk about those years and it's like, I'm talking about a third person cause it's 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, yeah, for, um, you know, five years, I was a dealer. I was a drug addict. All my friends were dealers. All my friends, you know, this was a new York, this was the hippies. Yeah. And, um, um, most of them are dead. You know, we really, we, you know, the amount of partying, the amount of drugs that we consumed in the 60s were, were unbelievable. And um, what happened was I woke up one morning in 1972, and my best friend Victor was a junkie, and my girlfriend was a junkie, and there was heroin everywhere, and I had OD'd, and, and I just said, if I continue on this road, I'm going to die. I'm either going to die from a drug overdose, or I'm going to be murdered in a bad neighborhood doing the drug deal because you had had guns and knives to your head and stuff like that yeah, right? guns knives to my throat yeah did you ever get so, caught or did you ever go to jail no never wow i can see so here what happened was i woke up and i went john you never got busted you're not in the hospital your brain's still intact even though you took acid over 250 times Jesus. You know, i mean i took That's... lsd every day in the summer of 68 every day for three months because i wanted to learn how to control hallucinations did you do, so, did you do it? Were you able to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I took a lot of acid the first time and I almost went up in Bellevue. Uh, Cause I write about it in my book. The experience oh. was unbelievable. And, and I thought I was losing my mind. Uh, I thought I was actually losing my mind. I go into great detail as to what happened that day, but I okay. actually took a shower in the middle of the day because I was trying to, to control the urge to tell my parents to take me to Bellevue. And while I was in the shower, uh, my head left my body, moved over to a windowsill, and watched my headless body wash itself. Oh, at which shit! Point, I thought, at which point, and my parents, when I tried to talk to them, they had turned into giant hogs in the living room. So there were these big <laughs> oh, hogs fuck. reading the New York Times. Oh, my it God. It happened on April 7th, 1968. The reason why I know the date, or April 9th, this was the date of the Martin Luther King funeral. So my parents were watching the funeral on TV. 
And I decided that day I had been selling LSD for a while. So I may as well take it, find out what the fuck it's all about. Mm -hmm. And oh my God. So, so I thought I was going to, a, I didn't know what to do. Like when well, I tell my parents, take me to Bellevue, then they're going to freak out. Then these two big hogs are going to grab me and put me in a police car. And anyway, bottom line was when I finally came down that later on that day, I said to myself, I have a choice, either never take it again or understand how to control my hallucination. So I stay, I started taking small amounts every day and built up more and more and more until I learned how to function on acid. Wow, and, that's fine. I've never heard and, of somebody take that I approach. I got to be really good at it. I got to be able to take <laughs> huh. two tabs of blue cheer, go out to a concert, sell drugs, convert money into foreign currency while everything was melting around me and no problem. Wow. Do you yeah, think that so helped you with your focus sure. in terms of like music and stuff? Um, well, yeah. I mean, you know, how old are you? 43. Okay. So, so I'm 60, I'll be 69 next week. Okay. And so if you were born in 52, 53, and you were 15, 16, 17 years old, you know, in 68, 69, 70, so one, and you lived in New York, LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, there were these concert halls. And every weekend, you could see everybody you ever wanted to see. So there was nothing special about it. Led Zeppelin be playing this weekend and Jimi Hendrix is next weekend. The Grateful Dead is the weekend after that. And Janis Joplin is the weekend after that. Crazy. And and Jeff Beck is the weekend after that. And Jeff Thortel is the weekend after that. And everything was three bands to a bill and each ticket was $3. And if you couldn't afford three bucks, you see the same bands in Central Park in the summer for a dollar, dollar, dollar fifty. Jimi Hendrix, Chambers Brothers. Oh, wow. Everybody. Right? I want to and change you, my time machine dollar, answer. I want to come back to this portion. Dollar, you just hung outside. Yeah. Because it was so loud you could hear it anyway. Anyway, when you have that at your disposal, all these amazing artists on a weekly basis, and you're a musician and you're looking for inspiration, you got it. Yeah. And you, and so, I mean, was that kind of your focus then after you decided, okay, I'm quitting the drugs and this, did that kind of become your drug, like doing music and starting a band and, and want, trying to grow the band? Well, I had already been playing for a long time, but um, the, the end of the drug use coincided with a real focus to, to, to get a band together. To do like music. Yeah. Band. Yeah. So, so I jammed with a lot of people. Yeah. And I do, I know you probably already talked about this a million times and you're sick of it, but you did audition for Wicked Lester, which was the, you know, the early formation of Kiss with Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons. Was there anything when you auditioned for that? Was there anything, any clue that gave, get the, the, these guys are different. Like the, this is, these guys are going to make it. There's something special. These guys are, they just seem like regular audition at the time. When I was auditioning with them, no. But then when they got, when they hired Ace, Mm-hmm. Um, sometime around September, October 72, they had, they had Peter and Ace now were in the band. So they were fully formed now. Mm -hmm. uh, I was jamming with their old guys from Wicked Lester. So I, I couldn't tell you that there was something about the jam session that made me think it was anything more special than another bunch of guys wanting to be in a band. Mm -hmm. You know, huh. I mean, there was Gene and Paul and three other guys who looked like they were in the Grateful Dead. They had mustaches <laughs> and beards and they were, they were going to fire those guys. They told me they don't know they're being, or we're breaking up the band. I don't remember exactly. What okay. Said, but, uh, but no, but then, uh, you know, and they gave me the Wicked Lester demo tapes and they were, pretty hokey sounding i mean they're out there now it's not like it's a secret if you hear some of the stuff you know steven still plays guitar and still still um still sweet ophelia because he was at electric lady studios and they were doing the demos for that so he's on guitar they did a song called like a country song in which paul says he was born in a log cabin on the shores of the illinois you know like <laughs> you know like really yeah. and then they did she she with flutes, like you sound like Jethro Tull. You know, she walks in like, doo, 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 like with flutes and piccolos or whatever. <laughs> so, and they said to me, this is not who we are. This yeah. sounds like Looking Glass. Do you know who Looking Glass is? They had a hit called Brandy. You're yeah, fine, yeah, yeah. Or, I was going to say that. Yeah, yeah. For they sure. knew. The, I think they knew them. Okay. I think they knew the guys. And, and well, anyway, they just said, we sound like Looking Glass. We're not going to be like Looking Glass. They said, uh, we want to be like um, Slade. 
And they started naming all these English bands that I wasn't that familiar with at that moment that they mm -hmm. were talking to me about. Sure. And they just said, do you, do you like Slade? And I hadn't heard of Slade yet. So they said they wear platform shoes and they're loud. And so I knew they knew a direction they were going in, which is important mm -hmm. because the only mm -hmm. other band that was successful from that period of time out of New York was the New York Dolls. And so uh, we all used to go down and see the Dolls because the Dolls had all this hype going for them. Didn't you say in you fact, didn't think they, they sounded good, though? Scene. And in the January edition of Rock Scene, Dolls on the cover and Twisted Sister and Kiss are in little black and white photos. You know, like in the inside sheet. Yeah. You know? Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, but when I saw Kiss as Kiss, which was, I think, a week after they changed the name and Ace painted the logo on a bed sheet. And they invited me down to the loft on 23rd Street and they played the whole set with Marshall Amps, heavy, mm -hmm. heavy. And I went, wow. And Ace was great. I wasn't anywhere near as good. They picked the right guy. 100% they picked the right guy. Yeah. Ace was perfect. He understood it. You know, recently someone said to me, who are the most influential guitar players in, in rock? And I said, well, let's talk about American versus British. I said, in America, you got Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, and Ace Frehley. Mm -hmm. I said, how can you put Ace Frehley in the same category? I said, because if you're asking me who made more kids dream about being rock stars, Ace Frehley for sure. is probably responsible for more kids dreaming about being a rock star than anyone else except for maybe Jimi Hendrix and Eddie Van Halen. Mm -hmm. No, I agree 100%. Yeah. You cannot take away, I, you know, you could say, well, he's not technically that great. It has nothing to do with it. Keith Richards isn't technically, technically great, but he's responsible for millions of people wanting to be rock stars. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They carry themselves in a certain way. They play with a certain attitude. That's the difference between technique and brilliance and feeling. For sure. It's, Ace played with an enormous feeling. And so I don't need to know, I don't need someone to tell me that about the technical aspects of Ace's playing. I know what they are. Right. That's not the point. No, I agree. Yeah. Cause I, I ask these musicians I interview all the time and they all, Kiss is only probably the number one most influential band yeah, that I, oh yeah, Kiss big time, everybody. And people that you wouldn't the, think, heavier bands, yeah. like country and bands. Like, yeah. End of story. I yeah. mean, it's that simple. It has nothing to do with whether I'm friends with them, not friends with them agree with him politically not whatever <laughs> he responsible for creating more dreams than probably anybody else for sure so your band though uh, before they were twisted sister they were silver star and i love this story of uh, and i watched the documentary uh, we are twisted fucking sister it's 12 years before your you know big break but it, and it's, it makes me think like why didn't you guys give up but you guys were making it as a bar band i think you said that you made a uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as a bar band in New York. Now explain the, the, the numbers on this though, because he says you played six shows a night, five shows or six five shows nights, a night. five shows sure. a night, six nights yeah. a week. How do you do five shows in one night? Is that like at the same venue or you, you're not switching same venues? Venue. Okay. You do. The, the, they were called sets. Okay. Five, five, five sets. sets a night. But the thing is back in those days, we did costume changes after every show and every show was different. So we did five performances a night. Wow. So for the first, so so to put this in perspective, you take a calculator, all right? Take a calculator and say um, that's 30 shows a week times 52. So in a year, you're playing 1,500 shows. That's insane. Okay? Now, yeah. when bands come to me and they say to me, I want you to see my band, and I say, how many shows have you played? And they go, I say, how long have you been together? Two years. Uh, how many shows you played? Oh, about 50. I said, you've done 50 shows total. Yeah, yeah, man, that's a lot. I said, okay, when you get to 500, call me. Well, we'll never get to 500. I said, the chances are I won't come and see your band. Because in the first two years, I was already at 3,000 shows. Okay. That's a lot. So, and then as time went on, the sets, we went from five sets a night to four sets a night to three sets a night to two sets a night to one over the 10 year period. So by the time you got to um, 1982, when we got signed to our record deal, you know, there was already 7,000 performances. You know? oh. So 
when people talk about how great we are as a live band and how how can we be so great? I said, well, if you do something 7,000 times and you suck at it, you got a real problem. <laughs> Practice you know, for you sure. You shouldn't be in that business. You know? Yeah. So, so talk about so some what of the- what happens is when you play that much, when you play that much, you learn how to do it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of younger bands don't have that luxury. I don't blame them. You know, everyone, every era is different. But if you look at the greatest, I mean, Ted Nugent, Jay Giles, Springsteen, we all came out of the bar scene, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's, that's trial by fire. Yeah, no, for sure. And I I think you can still do that. Maybe not uh, five sets a night, but I think you could do five or six shows a week. If you, some, a lot of these people just go into the bars, Hey, can I play here? And I'll use a tip jar or whatever. And I mean, there's ways to do it. I would think if if there's, there's another issue that you need to keep in mind. The drinking age was 18. That's right. And as a drinking age of 18, kids who were 15 had fake proof because you could make proof in in school, in a printing class in school. Mm -hmm. I mean, proof was not hard to make fake. So think about the thousands of kids available Mm. to the scene, which is why the copy scene was so big, so huge, because the bars were huge. Right. They were huge. The bars were gigantic. You yeah. know, you can't, um, that doesn't exist today. Yeah. It's you know, like, it's, it's, it's kind of like a we're... bar holds 300 people yeah. in our day. The bars held up to 5,000 people. Oh, that's crazy. To play cover material. We're not talking concerts here. We're talking cover bands, you know, we're talking cover bands could play to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people in the tri-state area. Cause the clubs were gigantic. So what happens is you learn how to play to 3,000 people. When you learn how to play to 3,000 people or 5,000 5, people, then there's no, it's an easy jump to 10,000 to 15 to 20. It, it doesn't matter anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, people said to me, man, 100,000 people. I said, once you get past 10,000, it's just an amorphous mass, you know, and you have to learn how to do it. There's a technique to doing it because you have to understand the technique, but it's technique. Mm-hmm learn how to entertain masses of people so there's maybe 30 acts in the world that can play to 100,000 people where the promoter can trust you to play to 100,000 people you know because that's a big that's a big deal uh-huh. you know you, you have a festival and you're closing the festival and there's 100,000 people there and you suck that's gonna suck for the festival so how many bands can play to 100,000 people Metallica can Kiss can uh, we can, Iron Maiden can, ACDC can, Judas Priest can, Alice Cooper can. Like, we know how to do it. And it's an art form. It For sure. So yeah. Long. It took a lot of those years. So, but and during those, like, club, like, I love how that's, like, the focus of the documentary is, like, the those struggling years. It sounds like you had a lot of adversity. Like you said, the drinking age, the gas price thing. There was murders in New York. And then talk about the, uh, this is the part that I'm fascinated about, because I, I didn't know this, that, the, there was there was mob stuff going on in New York, right? You said you worked with Henry Hill from Goodfellas. He owned yeah, one of the Hill bars. At a bar that we worked at. Yeah. And uh, and so the whole Goodfellas vibe was not just in that bar. It was in probably ninety percent of the bars. Mm. But I will tell you, no club owner ever came up to me and said, "I'm a mobster." Right. No club owner ever came up to me and said, "We just killed somebody." Okay. It was just more or less understood that there was an environment and the way they conducted their business and how they talked to you, you could reasonably assume that more or less there was some sort of involvement. Plus, it's a cash business. So, you know, mob launders money through cash. But nobody ever said to me, I'm a mobster. Nobody ever said to me, I'm a bag. No one ever brought me in a room and said, we're planning to kill this guy. Didn't happen. But didn't they burn your truck down? Well, the the truck was blown up by a rival club owner having nothing to do with the underworld. Okay. He was just nothing mad. With the underworld. It had to do with the fact that we refused to play his room because he was a racist. He was an overt racist who made extremely horrific racist statements in my presence and Dee's presence. And Dee and I said, you know what? I don't like this guy. So let's not play his room anymore. So we stopped playing his room. And within a year of us doing it, 
one night in another club, our truck was blown up and, and, and it was a brand new truck. And while we were on stage playing and someone said, your truck is on fire and they opened up the back door, there was about 1800 people in the room and there's my new truck in flames. Ugh. In fact, the flames were so big that the truck that was next to it from another band that broke down the night before that melted that truck. Mm. So we didn't know who sabotaged the truck. But two years after that incident, we were playing yet another bar. And a woman walked up to me and said, um, hey, you know, your truck was burned down a couple of years ago. I said, yeah. She goes, well, my ex-husband did it because his father told him to go do it. And his father was this owner of this room. Huh. So uh, again, this is hearsay. Uh, we never, you know, we obviously had a, the police showed up, you know, they did an investigation. They didn't know who did what to mm -hmm. whom, and nobody ever was prosecuted, but we did suffer. Um, we did suffer the destruction of our, of our truck by somebody. And that purportedly was a rival club owner. That's crazy. I mean, just the tenacity you guys had to just keep going after all these mishaps, lineup changes and all sorts of these kinds of things. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, the club scene was unique in the tri-state area. So you could, you could earn a good living except the difference between us and all the other bands that were also playing on the circuit was we put every dollar back into the business. We lived on a very low salary. We were making $10,000 a year each for years you know, for a year per person, like it's very low. We were being supported by girlfriends and, you know, also you have to keep in mind, this was 40 years ago, 40 years ago, gasoline was 50 cents a gallon, you know, and renting an apartment or a house was cheap. You know, the first band house was $300 a month. The second band house we got was $700 a month. You know, these are all scaled economics. Mm -hmm. so you have to figure out how do you run a business? You have expenses. Yeah. This is very not rock and roll. <laughs> but you, you know, took that part on for a lot of the bands well, in the early days. And then twisted business. Yeah. Because I didn't understand that I was creating a business model until I looked back at it and realized I was creating a business model. Uh, I was just reacting to our daily, weekly, monthly issues that we had and over years and years and years of trying to make it i had to understand the difference in challenges crises catastrophes you know like what like every day was a challenge and then once a month there was a crisis and then once a year there was a catastrophe and the more you succeed past these problems the more you have confidence to handle them as they come up. And that's really what I teach when I do my motivational speaking and my keynote speeches and what the book is about. The book is called Twisted Business and the twisted was T-W-I-S-T-E-D, which tenacity, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline. And these were the seven uh, traits that the band um, uh, exemplified, although we didn't know it at the time. Right. Because wasn't it originally going to be called the twisted method of reinvention? Because it's all about yeah. reinventing and overcoming rejection. Isn't that yeah. a big theme to the book? Yeah. Well, like I say, we were turned down more times in a bed sheet in a whorehouse, and I, we've come back more times in Freddy Krueger, <laughs> which is true. Yeah. But then again, you ask any artist, and they'll say the same thing. They may not say it that articulately or that funny way of saying it, but rejection's huge in this business. If you can't handle rejection, you're in the wrong business, man, because that's all this business is about. It's no. The business is about the word no. <laughs> and, you know, then you get told, you know, you're too loud, you're too soft, you're too green, you're too blue, you're too metal, you're too pop, your hair's this. I mean, we have these rejection letters from record labels. I don't like the color of the lead singer's pants. <laughs> the heels are too high. And the amount of bullshit that you see, it's, you know, so after a while, you start to get um, cynical about it. Yeah. And, you know, and then it's hard to, but we were successful in making money so we could continue on. I, I, people always say to me, how did you continue? Well, we were financially stable, right? right? So the S in twisted, which is stability, that's, we were stable financially. Sure. However, 
the writing on the wall was that we weren't going to be because the drinking age was going up, which means the bars right. were going to get smaller. So there was a time crunch where I felt like we were on um, an iceberg that was melting and we had to get plucked off by a helicopter <laughs> before it melted. Right. And it drowned us. Yeah. So the club scene was a giant iceberg. That makes sense. No, and, and then and for years it was, it, and then it started melting. Yeah. And so by 1982, the, the drinking age laws were changing. And if we didn't get out when we got out, the scene kind of crumbled. And eventually you did. You got the, you know, you know under the blade. And I think it's uh, the, your biggest album in 1984, though, was interesting. The Stay Hungry, produced by Tom Warman. You said that at first he didn't like you guys. He didn't believe it. There's another person that does even the producer of your band. He brought all these cover songs, which really offended Dee Snyder. It's true. Yeah. And also the record label didn't really like us. And the president of the record label in America hated us. And although he did bring Tom Worman in and Worman was the hottest producer in the music business, that's true. Yeah. It, it was, it, and he charged a lot of money and he gets paid a lot of money and he still gets paid a lot of money to this day. He makes a fortune off of our songs. Um, and Tom made a record that worked, you know, D has a real issue with Worman because D's a songwriter and didn't like the way Tom to talked to him about his songs mm. and has never forgiven him. Really? Yeah. They've never, they've never, it's, they've never, never, I have had on again, off again relationship with Tom. I like Tom. Mm -hmm. um, he made, you know, look, how can you argue a record that sold 6 million copies? Yeah. You can't, but you know, if you read, if you read the, the um, Walter Yetnikoff, book. He was the president of Columbia Records when Michael Jackson released Thriller. Mm. If you read the Walter Yetnikoff book called Howling at the Moon, he talks about Michael Jackson calling him up and telling him to take Quincy Jones's name off the producer credits of Thriller. What? And he said, Michael, I can't do that. And Michael goes, he didn't produce the record I did. And this goes back to fundamental differences with managers, producers, record company presidents, like who gave mm. birth to who? Who's responsible for the success? Mm. Okay. So people resent other people's success. They, rep they resent people's claiming credit for people's success, mm -hmm. which happens all the time. Everybody wants to be, what do they say? Success has a million fathers and failure is an orphan. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. Uh, and, and it's true. So who's responsible for Stay Hungry's success? Was it MTV? Was it Tom? Was it, was it the president of Atlantic because he did promote us on MTV? Was it the director of the videos, Marty Kalner? Was it Tom Worman? You know, it was a combination of things. Um, it was it, it was the right songs, right? Mm -hmm. It was the right songs at the right time. Was it a heavy sounding record? No. Uh, Tom didn't make heavy records. We didn't like his records he made with Motley Crue. We thought it sounded wimpy. He wasn't a heavy metal guy, you know, like Tom Malam from Judas Priest made heavy metal records. You could feel the heaviness the lack of better way to describe it. We, and we were that because the band wasn't a hair band. We were a bar band from New York. We were not a West coast, you know, metal band. We were like this bar band, this heavy duty bar band. And, and Tom produced us in a way that was commercially very viable. So I appreciate that. And many years later, um, I was having a conversation with Ahmed Erdogan, the chairman of Atlantic Records, a super famous, you know, founder of Atlantic and the guy who, you know, produced some of the great, Ray Charles. I mean, his story is legendary. And I asked him uh, how he succeeded in a label that went from Ray Charles, you know, f through Buffalo Springfield and Cream and then Led Zeppelin and then ACDC and then Twisted Sister. And then like, how do you do that? Yeah. And he said two things. He said, first of all, you hire competent people who can hear things that you can't hear. Cause he said, if he had a label of just music, he loved, he'd be broke. <laughs> but the other thing he huh. said, which I talk about in the book and which I believe is he said, success is easy. If you don't mind who gets the credit. And that's a very, that's good. And, statement that's really smart you know and so uh d gets the credit you know if d didn't write the songs and sing the songs I, you wouldn't be interviewing me true Twisted didn't make it because i made twisted sister make it i am a piece of a i'm a part of a cog sure it's greater than me i bring 
this to it. Mm -hmm. D brings this to it. Mark Mendoza brings this to it. Eddie Ojeda brings this to it. AJ Perro brings this to it. Uh, you know, that's what happens. So are there people who take full credit for everything they do in this world? Yeah. Uh, but if you're really realistic, you understand that your success is a combination of of confluences of circumstances and coincidences that you can't even predict. Mm -hmm. You know, timing. For sure. You know, we hit it at the right time when bands like us and MTV hit a nexus. Who could have predicted it 10 years earlier? There was no MTV. Yeah, that's a good point. There was no way of knowing who was going to be where and how that was going to work. I mean, I remember, so this conversation I had with Doug Morris, who was the president of Atlantic, um, the fateful conversation I had with him in December 83 was, um, he said, well, you know, I don't like your band. I never liked your band, but you know, you guys sold a hundred thousand albums of can't stop rock and roll without me putting any money into it, which means you had like a fan base. So he said, so next year I'm going to spend whatever it takes to make you the biggest band in the world. And when he said it to me, I was like, yeah, this guy's so full of shit. Cause I'm a New York guy cynical as hell. I walked out of the room. Uh, someone said to me, what did he say? I said, he's going to make us the biggest band in the world. They said, that's great. I said, no, it's not. He's full of shit. He's mm -hmm. not going to do anything. So of course, you know, but he did say to me, he said, he said, you know, this thing, you know, this thing called MTV. <laughs> I go, yeah. And he goes, well, do you know who owns MTV? I said, no. He said, we do. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's owned by a partnership of American Express and Warner Music. And he said, if you give me the right video, we'll jam it on MTV. Oh. And so he did. We yeah. did. We had the right song, the right producer, made the right video. Atlantic put the hammer down. Amazing. And so and, why and didn't so finally all the good so here's the here's the point. The point is, is that with all the bad shit that happened to us for year year in and year out, yeah, this was a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you wait Huge. around long enough, it turns. That's good. Yeah, it's just like 12 years, a long time to wait. But um the one question I had though, so that big album, Stay Hungry, obviously three great videos, three great singles. Why was Burn in Hell? never released as a single or a music video. Cause I feel like that would have blown up. Do you think it was, too, I know it was in the Pee Wee's big adventure movie and stuff, but did, was it too heavy at the time? Or cause I listened to it now and I'm like, this I think is Atlanta such a just great wanted song. a new album. Oh really? They just wanted to move forward. And then of course we made a, a mistake. You know, the first video from 198 from come out and play should have been fire still burns. Mm -hmm. Not leader of the pack. But, and that kind of, that was a big mistake. But, okay. But, but yeah, uh, but sh yeah, there should have been a lot of things happening. We should have released Burn in Hell. There should have been a lot of different things going on. I, and it didn't. Yeah, I didn't know you guys had this video, Be Cruel to Your School. I've never seen this video until this morning. I watched it. I'm like, this is great. I love this. It's like the old school Twisted Sister video. I found out MTV didn't play it because they thought it was too graphic or something. Yeah, we were banned in every country but Norway. <laughs> and so, that video today... It looks like it was made in Disneyland. Yeah, right? I mean, it's like, well, I'm looking at it. It's like, it's so funny. The guy's, he's a zombie and he's feeding himself food through his neck. I'm like, this is hilarious. But so did they give you a chance to edit it and cut it? Or were you just? I don't remember. It was a horrible time because the record label hated the video. Mm. And they wouldn't support it. And they didn't reimburse. We paid for the video and they wouldn't reimburse us for the video. So we got screwed there. We spent, at the time, it was among the most expensive videos ever made yeah because the time alice cooper's in it billy Who's joel got, well billy it was alice cooper clarence clemens billy joel they were on the record uh alice was in the video laney kazan the actress is in the zombie is the sh is the cook in the zombie kitchen who 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 is like cutting up the stuff yeah that's I don't know if you know who laney kazan is she's a super famous actress so she played the she played the chef in the zombie kitchen it was a lot of fun yeah that's cool and uh the the label didn't share our vision and didn't support it. And that thing fell apart. So. Right. And then you guys release another album and then that the band breaks up, but I kind of want to hear about this portion of, of, you know, this was obviously a tough time in your life. 1999, you, you go to bankruptcy court, you're divorced. Uh, you know, then at some point I'm always fascinated by this. You're selling stereos because, and I hear about these career changes by huge rock stars and I never realized how common this was, but talk about those days. Cause that must've been a tough before seven dust takes off. Cause we'll get to that. But that must have been a tough time for you to go from playing arenas to now you're selling stereos. Um, well, in the book, I describe 
these four levels that you deal with, which is challenges, crises, catastrophes, and nuclear option. And the nuclear option is when the whole thing was blown up. The band, you know, D left, and I just and it blew. I I really said the whole thing is over. I'm blowing it up, and the lawsuit happened, and and we I had to file for bankruptcy, and I walked out of bankruptcy court you know, almost kind of half laughing at the absurdity of the whole thing, because I'm supposedly smart. But you know, um, there's there's two ways you can approach cat really catastrophic issues in your life, there's proactive and reactive. And the difference is I was reactive, I was proactive, meaning I knew what was coming. And I was able to prepare myself for it, as opposed to something happening like reactive crises like you get they get a phone call because your best friend died in a car crash you, you can't even process it or something so i mean i knew i knew this is all heading in a really bad way and uh and i decided well i'm blowing my life up too i'm going to get a divorce and change my life and and i did and i started imagining a band an, an artist with a local gym owner and we had some success early on with him and then it fell apart and i needed a gig my wife at the time was uh, very successful in the music industry. She was very successful. She was an executive assistant for a major oh. label. And she was making a lot of money. So it wasn't like there was pressure on me to get a job, but I needed to get a job. And I used to buy really high-end audio gear at Lyric Hi-Fi, which was the preeminent hi-fi store in, in the world. I mean, high-end audio stuff, like crazy audio stuff. Like people don't understand, like... Turntables that cost twenty thousand dollars, and amplifiers that cost fifty thousand dollars, and speakers that cost a hundred thousand dollars, and speaker cable that cost twenty thousand dollars—crazy stuff. I used to buy stuff there, and I was hanging out there because I had nothing to do. And the owner kind of sensed something was weird because I was hanging out too much. Mm. And he said, "Well, you know a lot about this gear. Do you want to sell it?" And I went, and I needed a job really bad because just for my own self-esteem. So I took the job. And I just said, don't ever tell anybody what I do for a living, who I was. I don't want to deal with this. Did, is Jay, what are you doing here selling stairs? Yeah, did so anyone ever to, recognize you? No. I used to go to wow. cut my hair off. I, I used to go to people's houses on Park Avenue to measure for stereos. And I had to go in through the back door because I was the help. You know, this is me, right? So now all of a sudden, I don't walk through the front door of apartment buildings. I have to walk through the back door. And I would go to the back door and I'd go to their apartments and and invariably I would see my records there. <laughs> it's gotta there be so their, weird. And, and and I would never say I don't want to get into a conversation about it. So I never said a word to anybody. I would just, okay, cool. You know, I test out the equipment. And I did that for four years. Wow. And so while you're doing that, then you then you start managing another band called Red. Th Originally, they were called Red Threat, then Snake Nation, then Crawl Space, then eventually they became Seven Dust. How did you know that did or did you know that Seven Dust was going to this is a got the it factor. This is the band. This is going to be huge because, I mean, it didn't sound like you had managed like 100 bands and one of them hit like you only hit manage a, a couple bands. Right. And this is a, this is one that hit right away. Well, you know, Seven Dust is another long term project. When I fell into them through uh, Dennis Berardi, who was the owner of Kramer Guitars, turned me on to somebody. I don't know who it was, but somehow we found a band in Atlanta called Red Threat, and they were an ACDC kind of band, a really good band. So we, we signed oh, really? them to a production deal, and that fell apart. And then they morphed into another band uh, called Cupid's Arrow. And then a couple of members changed and that fell apart and they morphed into another band called snake nation. Mm -hmm. And then they lost a couple of other members and that fell apart. And then, um, at one point around, let's say it started in 1988 with red threat. So at some point around 1992, I was in Atlanta and I saw, um, snake nation, and a band opened for Snake Nation called Body and Soul with a black lead singer. And that was Lejean. Mm -hmm. And I remember at that point, all the guys in Red Threat that were in the original band that I signed a production deal, they were all gone. Now they've been replaced, like twisted oh, in a way. They interesting. Through, like multiple changes and multiple okay. images. And I said to the drummer, Morgan Rose, I said, if you ever get that lead singer guy and you ever work with him, let me know. And so huh. 1995... Morgan called me and said, we got that guy. 
And my wife said, you got a job as a stereo salesman. You had your shot in the music industry. It's over. Don't do it. Really? Sure. But the singer's really great. And I really think the band's good. And she said, listen, you spent seven years chasing this band, going through all these changes. You spent a fortune of your own money doing demos. Everything has come up empty handed. And I don't think you should do it. And I said to her, I want to try one more time. And she said, I don't want you to spend a dime. So I called Morgan and I said, listen, man, I, I can't do it. I said, I can't get involved. My wife doesn't want me to get involved in it. And I have a life. I have a kid now. And Morgan said to me, we'll come to New York instead of you coming down to Atlanta. And I went, oh, man, you'll, you're willing to come up here to play for me? Because I, cause I couldn't fly down to Atlanta. I was working. Uh -huh. And he said, yes. And I said, are you sure? How are you going to do that? And he goes, we'll rent a van and come up. Can you get us gigs? So I called up the Bitter End, uh, the Rockwood Music Hall, CBGBs, and a, a club called Spiral, three, uh, four rooms in New York, who I knew pretty much the, the owners. You uh -huh. know? And the guy in the Bitter End, which is a folk club, you know, not a rock club. They're a folk club. I mean, they basically they go back to the 60s with Bob Dylan and, you know, and Phil Oaks and all that stuff. And Kenny... The owner was a really nice guy, and I sent him the demo of of uh, I sent him a, a demo, and he goes, "I like him. I'll book him." And I went, "Oh my god!" So I I called Morgan. I said, "Okay, I got you four gigs." So they come up to New York. They play the bitter end. I have a film of this. this they're called they were called uh, Crawl Space at this point, and um, and there was like maybe ten people in the room before the band went on stage, and while the band played, everybody left, and I'm standing there with the camera. We're standing next to Kenny because they were so loud. You have to understand the room was only 30 feet wide and the band had Marshall, st like the band was, they were amazing. But this, you know, before them, it was a folk singer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they set yeah. up and they blasted okay. and people just w walked out of the room and I apologized to Ken. I said, I'm so sorry, man. And he goes, no, it's okay. I love the demo. Fuck it, I don't care. But across the street was the Rock Ridge Saloon and I had called up the owner and asked if I could book crawl space in there and she says well, where are they from i said lana she goes we only book new york bands here she was and she didn't care that i was jj french or twisted sister she goes I, i'm not going to book them well they were so loud that across the street was a rockwood and terry heard them came over and said to kenny at the bitter end this band's great i want him to play the rockwood so he says there's a manager so she walks over to me and uh, she goes, my name is Terry Kennedy. I said, yeah, I know who you are. You told me to go fuck myself. About three weeks ago. <laughs> I called you and you go, I don't book bands. I'm from New York. She goes, I'm sorry. They're great. Can they play now? <laughs> so we walked the amps wow. across the street and they played. And I had A&R guys come down. They passed on it. Then they played CBGBs to about 20 people. It was empty. <clears throat> Brought some more A&R guys. They turned it down. And they played Spiral, which was a club uh, on Delancey or Houston Street by Third Avenue, really fucked up neighborhood. It was all it was a junkie bar, I like junkies. And what happened was on their way back to their hotel, they got stopped at a alcohol checkpoint on 12th Avenue. And the band was in two vans and I was with one of the guitar players. And I don't know, I told the guys, don't drink up here because we have checkpoints all over the city. So don't drink, please do not drink. So, of course, they did, and they got through one checkpoint, and the checkpoint I was with, with the van, the police said to the kid who's the guitar player, who was 17, uh, they want to check his, uh, I don't drink, you know, so they checked his blood alcohol level, which was right above what should be, so they arrested him. And the cop looks at me, he goes, I know who you are, and I said, uh, he goes, you're the guy in Twist Sister. I said, yeah. He goes, well, why didn't you tell me? I wouldn't have, I would have let you go. And I said, because I could have told you and you could have arrested both of us. I don't know how it's going to work. You know, right, I mean? it could yeah. be either way. So he says, well, now we got to arrest your kid. So they arrest the guitar player and the guitar player um, winds up in the tombs, which is our prison system. Oh. And it's convoluted and it's big. And it took us four days to locate him. Meanwhile, the band couldn't go back to Atlanta until they 
got oh, the guitar shit. player. Right, yeah. Chris, the kid was 17. He was traumatized. I'm sure. Like, before we found him, finally. The reason why we had trouble finding him, he was a really pretty boy, and the police were afraid that he would be raped in prisons. They kept moving him from, from, from jail to jail to keep him safe. So it took us four days to find him. Wow. And when he was so traumatized by the event that when he got back to Atlanta, he quit the band. Oh. And he became a chef, from what I understand. Oh and God. Clint Lowry replaced him. And Clint, of course, writes most of the material. So it shows you how fate wow. uh, can kind of intercede. Yeah, you know, that's kind of so weird, crazy. Right? Yeah, so the kid, the, I, mean, the, I think the kid's name was Lee, and he was a wonderful kid, and he was a great player. He looked great. He was great, but I think he was totally traumatized. And last I heard, he had been out of the music business. I could be wrong. Mm. I haven't seen or spoken sure. in 25 years. I could be wrong. He was a wonderful kid. Anyway, they hired Clint, and Clint, of course, was the missing piece. Yeah. No, that's like a, the missing piece. It's a band. great band. So we did a demo, and I said to, and my wife came down, and she said, yeah, they're good. And then she said to me, look, you can spend X amount of dollars on trying to get them signed, but that's it. So mm. I was able to do it within the budget that I had. That's amazing. You're responsible, I mean, partly responsible for two giant acts, Twisted Sister and Seven Dust. It's amazing. Well, again, I'm a piece of a wheel. Piece of the wheel. Yeah, for sure. Right? I'm a piece of a wheel because... If Seven Dust wasn't a great band, we wouldn't yeah. be sitting here talking about it. Right. Seven Dust. No, I, I mean, I think it's always, I mean, even just these, uh, I don't know what you call them, hired guns or whatever, that, you know, like Rudy Sarzo plays with Ozzy and then Whitesnake and Quiet Riot. I'm like, that's amazing that you can just keep going to all these huge bands. I think that's great. Yeah, why wouldn't you want to be? And I think that it must be because, like you said, they're willing to not be the star of the show and just not There's another take thing credit. Too. They're incredibly professional. That's professionally true. and incredibly reliable. Mm -hmm. They have the look. Joel Hookstra, same thing, you know, in White Snake. Yeah. Joel is one of these journeyman guitar players mm -hmm. who's spectacular, looks great, always shows up on time. You know what, what Woody Allen says? Ninety-eight percent of success is showing up on time. It's true. Yeah, that's good advice. Show up on time. Do the job you're supposed to do. You stand a better chance than not of getting a gig. Absolutely. So I'm sure there's a lot of this stuff is in your book. We've mentioned it several times. Again, it's called uh, Twisted Business Lessons from My Life in Rock and Roll. Are there pictures in this book as well from some of the stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I can't wait. And then is there anything else like a, is there a tease you can give for the book? Like what is something in the book that's really big that's never been revealed that you can give us a little bit of a tease for? Is there anything? Well, I just think that there's so many stories there's hundreds of stories in the book, you know, hundreds mm. of them. Yeah, you know, the derivation of the name J.J. French has never been written about, and I tell that in the book, you know, for the first time ever. Mm. I never told the band members. I never told. I mean, I created this image of J.J. French, and that's not me. That's I am John French. I am not J.J. French. J.J. French is a is a creation, and I needed a creation because I didn't want to be. Um, I didn't want to be falsely absorbed into a fake rock and roll lifestyle, which was bullshit. I never bought into celebrity ever. And uh, I live where I live all my life. And I, in my, where I live, nobody knows what I do. And I don't want them to know what I do. And, you know, I, I don't like that much publicity. And, you know, other people love it. Lead huh. singers love that stuff. You know, I mean, that's why they're lead singers. I mean, there's a certain narcissistic streak. I, we, we tease D all the time. D's the archetype lead singer, phenomenal talent, great vocalist, great songwriter. And he is D. He's no longer Danny Snyder. I mean, he left Danny Snyder in Baldwin, you know. And I you named, gave him the name D, though, isn't that? Wasn't you gave him the name D. So, yeah. So he left Danny Snyder, you know, in 1976, the day that we called him D, that was the last time I called him Danny. And you guys, you have obviously, but I'm John, right. You guys have a good relationship now, but I think, is that another thing you talk about in the book is how you guys, you know, you got the friendship and the band kind of broke up at the same time. And then when you guys had this like, you know, reunion show, that's when you rekindled the friendship with D and there's, is that something no. that. Dee and I, no, I go into depth about how that happened. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a very emotional part for me. And that's how in the book though. Our relationship. It's in the book. It's in the book. Okay. And it was um, a credit to him and me. I mean, we were both adults at the time. And we decided to add it. We decided to be adults and not children. 
Okay. But then again, we were both humbled by the, um, by the band's failure. We both filed bankruptcy. Right. We both lost everything. You know, D lost all of it. D was surviving off of his wife's money as a hairdresser. And he would be passing out um, promotional flyers under windshields at, at catering halls on Long Island on a bicycle after Twisted Sister stopped. So you have to understand this is huge. The fact that the band was able to come back at the level that it came back at, which was bigger than we were ever in the 80s. Yeah, that's crazy. Probably the greatest thing about the band. Yeah, you said that they are the most, Twisted Sisters, the most licensed band. Our your music. music the most licensed. That's, and is that because of you going out and getting that work, or is that people coming to you and, and wanting the Combination. songs? Combination. Combination, okay. Yeah, first of all, uh, I don't think one could have predicted in 1975 or 76 that We Will Rock You and We Are the Champions would become these monster arena sized hits, right? Mm -hmm. But they did. I don't think anyone could have, I, there's no way we could have envisioned that I want to rock and we're not going to take it. We're going to embody the two most licensed heavy metal songs for commercials, TVs, shows, radio sh commercials, internet ads, product placement. There's no way we could have predicted it. Um, it started in 19, um, nine, what was it? 1999 was the first license. Mm. So, I mean, I thought something like that was going to happen when, when I was in bankruptcy court, I explained, and I go into the depth in the, in the book, a conversation I had with the judge when he wanted to take the name for me, because I owned the, the, the trademark for the name. And I made a plea to him that I thought that the band could someday come back and possibly have a commercial the Tide detergent in 10 years. That's what I said. That's the, so smart. The, and, and I said that because I'd seen in England, the song Stand By Me being used for a commercial and the song went to number one 30 years after the song was number one. And I thought that's just England being quirky. Mm -hmm. You know, the song winds up in a Tide commercial or something. It winds up being number one again from 1961. And, and I said to the judge, I said, well, maybe in 10 years, we're not going to take it. We'll be used in a Tide commercial. And if that happens, I want the rights to be able to put the band back together again and and maybe reunite and maybe make enough money to put my kid through college. I said, and I, I don't even have a kid, but maybe I will have one. And the judge one, that's a compelling argument. Let me keep the name. That's what, So if you didn't, if he didn't let you keep the name, what happens to it? If you go it back would have been owned by American Express, Winterland, all okay. of the companies that were part of the bankruptcy filing. Oh, okay. Wow. They all came to the hearing. Okay. Well, that's cool. They let you keep it then. Whatever crumbs they could grab from us. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I convinced the judge that we were worthless at the time. But we were. It was 1989. Sure. And we were worthless. So anyway, uh, so 10 years to the month of that statement, of that statement that I made to the judge. You want to talk about timing? You want to talk about my inherent wisdom? The greatest coincidence could possibly be that my bravado at that statement, in which I claim 10 years from now, we're going to be licensed to tie detergent. Well, 10 years to the month of that statement, Comtrex nasal spray license, we're not going to take. <laughs> and there was wow. no way. We had, I, you know, all of a sudden I got a letter from Warner Music or something. Comtrex just licensed the song. So in, in 2003, I suggested, well, we, we, I said we should re-record Stay Hungry and, or the band agreed to re-record Stay Hungry. And I said, we should use our songs instead of Warner Music's masters and sell our own masters to keep make more money. So we started doing that. So we recorded the whole album called Still Hungry, which, by the way, was a heavier version of Stay Hungry. So mm. it was the way we had envisioned Stay Hungry to sound, was the way we re-recorded it for Still Hungry. And 90% um, and of all of the re-record, 90% of all of the ads since then have been using our re-records, which from a financial oh. standpoint is huge. It helps you a lot more in. Oh, a lot more. Yeah. Okay. So, so that became important. And as time went on, the songs just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I sit back and marvel at the fact that um, just when I think, well, who could still want to do it? Facebook last year, I want to rock was the Super Bowl ad. Rachel yeah. Ray's dog food 
new Trish, just licensed, we're not going to take it for a year in a massive national advertising campaign. So it just continues on and on and on and on. Like every day you get these emails, so-and-so for this, so-and-so for that, so-and-so for this, so-and-so for that. It's it's amazing. That is and amazing. That's great. None of it was, you couldn't have predicted it. Mm-hmm. And more so than a Kiss song, you know, you don't hear Kiss songs on commercials and TV. You know, ACDC rarely, once in a while. Journey, I mean, to be fair, Journey's Don't Stop Believing is used an awful lot. Okay? Mm-hmm. Karaoke, Very too. Big. Fleetwood Max, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Very big. Those songs are big. There's like 10 songs that are used over. Think about this. There's 800 million songs. Why is it every time there's a medical commercial and there's a new drug, they only use one song. They use I Feel Good by James Brown. (laughs) They could use a million songs, but you hear I feel good. Why? A, it's a great song. Yeah. B, it makes people feel really good. They attach good vibe to it. Okay. So we, we meaning Journey, Fleetwood Mac, Twisted Sister, James Brown, we benefit by the continuing use because the more it's used, the more people want to use it because the more they know it, the more comfortable they feel with it. Mm-hmm. So you may be in a new band and go, why can't our song be used for Tide Detergent? And, and you know, the truth is, maybe it could. Maybe if you were able to convince the music buyer for that product that you're the song should be yours, maybe. But here's what happens. These guys sit around in a room, these advertising executives, and they got a new product and they go, okay, we got a new car, the Ford Falabalab, you know, what do we use? <laughs> and they'll go, how about I want to rock? <laughs> how about we're not going to take it? How about don't stop thinking about tomorrow? How about... Don't stop believing how it, because it's easy. Yeah. And, and a lot of those guys don't know music. They don't know indie rock and stuff. No. And, and also the public doesn't either. That's true. Okay. Yeah. So the, the buying public feels comfortable and I want to rock, you know, D wrote these amazing songs. We're not going to take it was a, a couple of years ago. There was a list of the top 30 songs that, that unite America. Okay. This is an NPR. The top 30 songs in United America. So I'm not even thinking Twisted's on the list. I'm just reading the songs, you know, Born in the USA, um, Blowing in the Wind, Times Are Changing, We Shall Overcome. Like, you know, we're talking standards. And, and, and it keeps going. It goes 30, 29, 28, 27, 26. So the number one, you get to number three, and it's We're Not Going to Take It. Wow, that's high on the list. And the, Two songs above us were two gospel songs that I swear I don't even know them. Huh. It wasn't like, people, get ready. There's a train to come. And I thought, you know, that would be, I could see that. But we were number three. That's huge. And I sat there and went, okay. You know, I asked D how he feels about that. He's written these songs. And these songs, they're not just famous here. When Brexit was happening in England, and people were arguing whether or not they wanted Brexit. They were singing, we're not going to Brexit in front of the parliament. <laughs> you know, my daughter uh, is English and she goes, dad, look at this. And she, you know, she, she, she recorded it off the TV, the, the BBC news. Wow. And you're hearing, we're not going to Brexit. And didn't they use the song in, um, it was one of the middle East wars. They tried to get somebody to come out of the a hole or something like that. And they played no, twisted. That was, what was that? No, that was when Noriega, when the, when this was this was in 1986 or 87 when the dictator of Panama Noriega was i think holed up in his palace okay and the United, and so there was a co- political cartoon with the members of Motley Crue and Twisted Sister jumping <laughs> out of an airplane and 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 like we're, we're screaming something and Motley Crue was shouted the devil and we're, and uh, the the joke was that here's bands that are accused by the Ameri- by our government as being horrible but we we're being used as a defensive weapon <laughs> in, in in an effort to protect America from a dictator right it was kind of funny you know because 
because life is weird. Because here we are in 1985, PMRC is set up, 1986. They drag D down to Washington to defend himself on videos that are just obviously cartoon videos, not designed to destroy the moral fabric of the youth of America. And um, D's going, what are you guys, nuts? I mean, these are cartoons. This is funny stuff. And, and because of that, we were harassed all over the United States. Laws were passed to keep us out of cities in Texas, anti-rock laws. You probably don't know this or realize this, but we were the laws were passed deliberately because they thought they were keeping Twisted Sister out of these cities because uh, we were singing about sex with children, dead people, and animals. Yeah, so Thinking what are... That's crazy. But what are your thoughts? Because it feels like it's like we've I thought we kind of beat this whole censorship thing. And now it feels like it's kind of gone full circle. And now there's all this censorship stuff coming back. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think some of it's good, though? Or is this the censor censoring the right thing about the woke part of it? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a, a term for it. it just seems like there's a lot of things that are being canceled or edited out of movies and, t- and TV shows from earlier in the day. And I don't know. It's just it's 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 kind of I don't know where it ends. It's just a censorship. Is I don't interesting. know where it ends either. You can't make a movie like Blazing Saddles again. Sure. Yeah, that it never makes happened. sense. You can't make it now. You can't make, you can't make Putney Swope. You can't make Animal House again the way it was. I mean, think about this. In 1961. One of the biggest songs of the year was called, if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, better make an ugly woman your wife. On my personal point of view, get an ugly girl to marry you because a pretty girl is basically going to confuse you. But an ugly girl will be so grateful that you married her that she'll be the best cook in the world. This was the number one track in 1961. What is this song called? I don't know if I've heard this. If you want to be happy for the rest of your life. Okay. By Jimmy Soul. Oh, wait, I think I know that song. I just don't if never know if I knew the lyrics. The your life, better make an ugly woman your wife. Yeah. So from my personal point of view, get an ugly girl to marry <laughs> you. Do you think that song could ever be released today? Ever? No. no. <laughs> In a million freaking years. <laughs> Definitely not. Never. So, and then you have Louie Louie that was banned by the FBI because nobody could understand the lyrics. They thought it was dirty. <laughs> and the song was the number two song of 1963. And, you know, I think if you listen to the song, you can't understand what he's saying. But the but back then, the controversy was he was saying something dirty or nasty. Mm-hmm. And so the FBI ban, had the song banned. Anyway, I don't know where it all ends. It's uh, it's tough. It, it, it is really it's really tough. I don't know. But fortunately for us, we're not in the crosshairs at this point because we're, <laughs> no, cause we're not playing. So I, yeah. I don't know what to say. Would you guys ever play again? I know you kind of did the farewell tour. Would you ever do just some one-off shows or festivals or something? Look, I used to say never. I'll never say never, but we have never discussed it. Okay. Well, there's it's the never- headline. Never say, tw- Twisted Sister, never say never. There we go. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, we have a song called Never Say Never. Yeah. You know, I, I, we used to say it would never happen. I will no longer say that. We we, we came back in 2003 for basically a two-year reunion, which lasted 14 years. Mm. And it lasted longer than the original band lasted with AJ. It was an incredible ride. And um, when we walked off stage, I personally just said, that's it for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm at it. But who knows? Okay. I mean, do you don't you don't miss playing live like even or just like at a club like do you ever get up and just jam or anything or uh no i don't even play around my house hmm. i got guitars everywhere because my wife said you got to keep practicing on it i can go months without picking up a guitar so what are you into now more all than over the house you're just more into the business side is that what you focus on and that's what you love well, or? i write i have i write for several magazines right yeah i, know book, that. I have the podcast yeah I and your book that. yeah I don't know what is there left to prove in the music industry for me. You know, you do 9,000 plus shows. I mean, for me, because remember, I go back before D and Eddie. So mm-hmm. I had those 3,000 extra sets yeah. before they came on. And um, I'm not missing it right now. Okay. And also, I'm much older. And the body doesn't react the way it does. We're not all Keith Richards. You know, we're not all like <laughs> supernatural. Well, no, and the irony is that you and, you and D are totally like sober. You don't do any drugs or alcohol. And so. Mark too. 
Nothing. Yeah. And so it's crazy that Keith Richards can be that old and still play. And isn't he, did he just now quit drinking the last couple of years or something? Or I, I, I met his manager the other night. I was, I was at a wedding and I was sitting next to his manager, as a matter of fact, oh. Jane Rose, you know, and we were talking about Keith. Hey, he's you know, pretty remarkable. You know, I'd like to figure out what gene pool he came from. <laughs> right. I think it's probably amazing. Yeah. But he does have arthritis. Oh. And it is hard for him to play. I understand there's a guitar player that hangs out backstage now in case Keith can't do the guitar parts. Oh. And they need someone to play the guitar parts. So on certain days when he really can't, they have a backup player. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I oh. mean, you know, so look, Keith is a legend. For sure. He's an absolute legend. The reason why I play guitar the way I do is because of a guitar solo that he took on the intro of a song called Down the Road a Piece, which was a Chuck Berry song that Rolling Stones did. And Keith's guitar intro to that song is the first lead solo I ever learned and became the basis of every lead solo I ever played. So I give him the credit. And his book is extraordinary. Oh, well, I'm excited for your book. So when does it officially come out? September 21st. 21st. Okay, we'll look for that. Yeah, yeah. My um, podcast is the JJ French Connection. That's J-Y-J-Y-F-R-E-N-C-H. The JJ French Connection. You can reach me um, via email at ask jj at uh ask ask jj j a y j a y t s at gmail.com so you can e email me any questions you want i've got a great lineup of guests i've got some great guests coming up no you this do summer. yeah so uh i appreciate you having me on yeah and i like to end each episode uh with a charity i think i understand you work with a couple different ones uh one for prostate cancer and one for um i don't even know how to say this word is it uveitis, uveitis. yeah uveitis is an eye disease it's the leading cause of blindness among girls in america Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's basically arthritis of the eyes. Um, it has to do with the UV lens in your eye being destroyed by your white blood cells because they think there's a disease going there. Mm. And it's part of the rheumatoid arthritis school of diseases. And it's not curable, but it's treatable. And because my daughter was treated at an early age, she has her eyesight. Otherwise, she'd probably be blind today. Um, so I raise money for the organization that treats it which is a mouthful. It's the Ocular Immunology and Uveitis Foundation, but the I-O-U-F. Okay. So I'll put that in the notes, yeah. Ocular Immunology and Uveitis Foundation, I-O-U-F. If you want to contribute to the I-O-U-F, you can do it online and also for zero cancer, which is an end to prostate cancer. I had prostate cancer and I was treated. And uh, so I helped raise awareness. Yeah, my dad had prostate cancer too, and he was treated, and he's doing good now. So yeah, that's good. great. I love love to hear those stories. Well, thank you so much for doing that. I'll put all this stuff in the notes, and uh, I'll, I'll put it out on social media. Well, thanks for having me on your show. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk later. You got it, man. You take care of yourself. All right. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, I don't know about you, uh, but I was on the edge of my seat in that interview, and I got to tell you, I listened to a lot of interviews with JJ. And I don't remember hearing a lot of those stories that he told me. So hopefully they're exclusive to my podcast only. Uh, but if you want to learn more about JJ, definitely check out the documentary, We Are Twisted Fucking Sister. It's free on Tubi, uh, if you don't mind the ads. And uh, also his book will be out in September. So definitely check that out as well. Follow JJ and Twisted Sister on social media to keep up with any updates. And you can follow me as well. And if you'd like to support the show, any activity that you have on social media or YouTube, such as comments, likes, shares, subscribes, etc., that will help me out quite a bit. Uh, and if you want to go that extra mile, you can write me a review wherever you listen. Thank you so much for taking the time to make it all, all the way through this episode. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And remember to shoot for the moon. <laughs>